Um, thank you all for joining us today um, and hope your uh, things are going well wherever you are. And uh, of course, as you already know, we're gonna be focusing today's event on um, helping students uh, get into the best possible uh, position to, to make that jump into the workforce, um, no matter where you are sort of in your studies, whether graduation is around the corner or, or maybe you still got a ways to go. Um, uh, but either way, I think you'll hopefully get a lot out of this event. Uh, I'm Justin Sablich and I'm DefX's careers editor and I'm really excited to talk to this uh, specific group of panelists. Uh, I, I, I got really excited assembling this team. I don't know if there's any like Marvel fans or comic book fans, but I felt like I was like assembling a team of superheroes uh, of uh, like a fantastic four of social impact and global development oh. professionals. Uh, everyone just has such a unique background and and I think uh, this group covers so many different bases um, and they've all had really interesting and amazing careers. So um, yeah, really looking forward to uh, talking to them and I'm gonna introduce them really quickly right now. Uh, first, uh, zooming in from Barcelona today is uh, Jasmine and Nuna. Uh, she's the founder of The Bloom, which is an amazing platform and newsletter, uh, lots of great resources and uh, job postings in the um, social impact space. And also she's an SDG uh, goalkeeper for the Melinda Gates Foundation and wears many other hats as well. So uh, welcome Jasmine, how are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing so well. I'm pumped to be on the super spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, no pressure. I don't, I, I, built, I built you all up quite high there. So I just, uh, yeah, uh, just, uh, you'll, you'll do fine. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jasmine, uh, for joining us. Uh, next, we have uh, in New York, uh, Nicole uh, Colin Vargas, uh, the HR business uh, partner with Chemonix. And uh, this is just a very experienced recruiter um, in the development sector and uh, really excited to have her with us today as well. Hi, Nicole. How are you? I am doing well, Justin. Hi to you and everyone that is joining. I am excited to be here. Um, and these panelists are awesome. So looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, next, we have... Um, oh, uh, Jack. <laughs> I, 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 I was kind of going out back order, but I already screwed that up. But uh, Jennifer Bangura in Malawi is also with us. She is the Director of Career Innovation at Mexford University. Um, also wears a ton of hats, consultant, uh, adjunct professor, has been a career coach, has a ton of amazing experience. Um, so thank you, Jennifer, for being part of this. And how are you doing today? Thanks so much. I'm lovely and really excited to be here. Um, thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, and last but not least, uh, Craig Velazer in uh, Columbia, Medellin, um, founder of PCDN.global uh, platform, which is another amazing resource uh, that has a ton of great learning resources and, and, and job opportunities in, in the social impact space. And again, he's a ton of hats as well. Um, he's worked in so many different roles as a development professional, professor, mentor, just uh, has so much great uh, experience. And I'm so excited that Craig's with us today too. Uh, Craig, how are you doing? Wonderful. Um, since I'm based in Colombia, we always have good coffee. So if anybody else is drinking coffee. <laughs> so. Excellent, can't beat that. Very cool. So yeah, thank you all again for being, being with us. Um, and there's so much to get into. So I'll try to speed through the rest of these sort of housekeeping items, but uh, uh, we just uh, want to make sure that People can hear us okay and do a quick sound check. So uh, can a few people just confirm with a, a yes in the chat box so that all good? Very cool. Okay, lots of people say yes. So I think we're good there. Um, but again, if you have any tech issues as you go, uh, we, got, we got people on standby to help out with that. You just shoot us a message and we'll help you with that. Um, so yeah, today's session is gonna last 60 minutes and uh, um, as always, we are going to reserve time towards the end to answer your questions. Uh, you can send questions in at any point uh, during the event. And you can you can uh, send questions specific to the panelist or just uh, a broad question that uh, we'll let the group uh, jump in on. So, yeah, please encourage you to send all those in as we go. And lastly, a reminder that uh, we will send out a, a recording of the, of the events to everyone who registered. Um, and as we mentioned in, on, during the sign-up process, uh, 
we, we created a special uh, discount, 25% uh, off uh, a DevX career account membership for folks who register today. Um, we'll, we'll reshare a link in the chat on that, but, uh, and you'll also get another link in the email. So just something to consider. Uh, we we uh, members get at full access to all the events that we do during the year, uh, full access to our jobs board and uh, all of our content. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, and again, just a reminder, you will get the a full recording um, early next week for, for today's event. Okay, so one last thing, we're gonna do a quick poll because uh, we're curious to see sort of uh, where you all are at uh, with your studies, whether your you know, graduation is, is right around the corner or um, if you're early in your studies or maybe you're just starting. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of choosing the best option that, uh, with uh, where you're at, it'll just kind of, you know, help us uh, help me guide our conversation. But... Okay. I think, yeah. We can close the close this up now. The okay. This is good to know. Yeah, for most people, you're. You're right on the edge there, getting ready, to make the leap. And then a few others, yeah, are earlier on. Okay, great. Really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think our topics today will be uh, right on point for, for, for everyone here. So, okay, so let's, <laughs> Alana, no option for those of us who are already working and graduated a long time ago. Well, that's true, but we're, we're still glad you're with us, I think. Yeah, the education is a lifelong process and uh, you can always consider uh, yeah, going back, but uh, no, but still, thank you for being here. Um, okay, so let's get into the, the questions. We have so much to get into. Um, we're gonna have a bit of a discussion. First part, uh, we're gonna kind of focus on experience uh, as far as what you, um, you know, how to best uh, prepare yourself, um, how to leverage your sort of internship volunteer experiences and and also sort of uh, communicating strengths on your CV, things like that. Um, but the first question I have for the group, and we'll start with Jasmine, um, I thought it'd be interesting to just have you all go, you know, take the time machine back. So when you were um, in a similar situation as our audience, uh, you know, maybe getting ready to graduate, just sort of give us a sense of what your mindset was back then. Um, you know, anything uh, along the lines of, did you kind of have a really good idea of what you wanted to do? Uh, did you feel ready? What kind of like sort of uh, volunteer or internship experience you might have had at that point? So, um, yeah, just if you can just spend a couple of minutes uh, sharing that, and we'll, we'll start with Jasmine. Sounds good. Um, no pressure being the first. I got this. Super squad. <laughs> uh, so first of all, congrats everyone on almost graduating. Whew, I'm like, you know, that's a lot. <laughs> but hopefully this session will be helpful. Um, I definitely reflected a lot on this question, have reflected a lot over the last few years. Uh, because a month, a few months before I graduated from both my undergraduate and graduate school experience, uh, my mindset was so bad. <laughs> um, in thinking of next steps, it was complete tunnel vision. Um, so I'm Italian Egyptian, um, but very, very Italian. Um, so I'm actually just going to show you like what I mean. And like with my hands, that's how we speak in Italy. So it's like this. <laughs> I was very much with an all or nothing mindset. Um, looking back in my mind, I think I had always this kind of unspoken 10 year plan. Um, I would get kind of this mix of like legal experiences and corporate experiences to start taking care of myself financially and then go on to do a career in social impact at the intersection of uh, women's rights and law. Um, I knew really, I thought I knew who I was and sort of how I wanted to work with others and the kind of career path that I desired, which was to fight for justice at a global organization in a legal career. So whenever I would think about next steps, if I'm being super honest with you all, it was never about steps. It was always the step. There was the plan. There was, I, I put so much pressure on myself on focusing on getting that one job or getting to work at that one employer. For me, that was the UN um, and that graduate school. And each was just a stepping stone in service of this larger plan. And to give you two concrete examples in university, uh, for example, I thought that before I had to work, before I could work in the world of social impact, I 
thought I needed to work in consulting or investment banking. <laughs> Um, a fun fact about me that I don't have like anywhere publicly on my LinkedIn, um, but sharing some fun secrets with you all. I will share this publicly one day, um, but I actually almost worked at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I got a full time job offer in the United States at Goldman Sachs. Uh, they were hosting a lot of recruitment events and talking about how it was a great stepping stone. And at the time, I definitely needed to start getting money and getting paid uh, out of university. It was very expensive in the U.S., so I attended a lot of their recruitment events and um, I actually did join Goldman, um, but I uh, rejected that job offer right before um, arriving in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, because of a lot of good friends and just listening to my inner compass. Um, so I ultimately rejected that job and went on to work in um, human rights, just straight out of um, university. Um, and then in my master's, sort of a few months before I graduated, I had that same mindset. Uh, when I was thinking about next steps, I spent so little time doing research that all I did was ruthlessly apply for jobs at the UN. I applied for like 10, 15 internships a day, maybe for a few months, 10, 15, like 5, 10. Um, and I networked only with people really at the UN or at UN uh, related organizations. My short term goal was very much that and then to go to law school in the US. Um, my yeah, the short term goals were just tied to my long term 10 year plan. Um, and I, yeah, I didn't really network much with um, people outside of that. So I'm sure that this may be relatable to some of you. When I speak to a lot of young people, this seems to be a common trend is that they feel like there's that pressure to enter that single organization. And uh, yeah, that's why I wanted to share this. It's definitely not something I talk about publicly and I very much want to more, but I felt like it was really important yeah. in hearing this question to share this with you all. So I hope that's valuable, um, but you can see that <laughs> my story is like, I just, yeah, it was a very tough part of the, the journey because I think getting rid of that tunnel vision is hard um, and university definitely encouraged that, um, at least mine did, um, to focus on, you know, that golden ticket employer, both, um, yeah, at the graduate and undergraduate level. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, I think that's I'm sure people can relate to that mindset of uh, of how to approach that. And also, it's got to be I think there's also kids. Uh, I say kids. I, I sound so old now. Uh, the kids, you know, um, they, <laughs> especially I mean, like you have an idea of what you want to do, but then you have a, you know, Goldman Sachs. Maybe that wasn't it didn't fit your definition, but it's also like, a, you know, um, a, a quite a prestigious organization in its own right with, with probably a decent salary it's you know it, there's a lot of pressure for, I think coming out of, out of school to feel like should I how can I pass up that just for like the security of it but I think it's really relevant to sort of yeah share your experience with balancing those different decisions that's, that's really interesting uh, thank you thank you Jasmine um, so yeah Jennifer we're gonna go in half luck order now uh, bring us back to your uh, the, the, to your old days there now you're making me sound old, Justin. <laughs> um, so I, if you want people to ask you the question, what are you going to do with that degree? Uh, then you should follow my path. So I studied art, history, and French. <laughs> so I did get asked a lot, what are you planning on doing with that? And I uh, thought I was going to go into museum studies um, when I graduated, which would have been a natural fit. But I really was more um more so had kind of a vision of what I wanted and a little bit of tunnel vision but um more so I wanted to live abroad I wanted to volunteer I also wanted health insurance so um and I wanted to use my French so these were some parameters of what I envisioned for after I graduated and I worked probably for a year of leading up to graduation to um to turn that into a reality and kind of check all of those boxes and I, i'm originally from the united states i currently live in malawi in southern africa um, and so as an american the most natural next step after graduation if i wanted to do all those things was to join the peace corps um, and at the time it was about an eight to nine months sometimes a little longer process. So I applied in um, August or September, the year before I graduated, um, interviewed, and then found out in March, I graduated in May, um, that I was accepted and where I was going to be moving, which was to Mali in West Africa. And I know we'll talk about this a little bit more, but, you know, at the 
core of how I like developed this vision was was volunteering. So I volunteered at a community garden um, all throughout undergrad. I, of course, was studying French. I studied abroad and, and language was really important to me. Um, and then I spoke with a few other return volunteers from my university to see you know, what their experience had been like. Um, but my vision was a little bit shorter term. I, I didn't know what was beyond doing Peace Corps. And I really hadn't thought much about it, except that I assumed that I would go into museum studies, which narrator plot twist I did not um so that yeah my mindset was um I like to have limited options because I get overwhelmed when I have too many things to choose from so I really put all of my efforts into to joining the Peace Corps and I actually didn't explore anything outside of it which could be tunnel vision and also it was just to help me not get too overwhelmed that's interesting yeah it's always I'll, one of the reasons I asked this question is because it's like it's always interesting to see like where people uh what they where they thought they might go and then where they end up ultimately it's just it's just it is like a it, it's just it's, I don't know if it's a lesson but it's it's just it's something I think it help helpful to keep that in mind that you know there are so many different paths and uh it, it, so that's why I'm kind of yeah starting with this question so thank you Jennifer uh, for that um I'm gonna go to Nicole now so um, I know you, you, you studied uh, human resources in, I think, PR um, yeah. at the University of Puerto Rico. So, so how, what, what were you thinking back then? I don't know what I was thinking because um, it is very interesting. Um, if I share, I actually wanted to be a forensic pathologist and I ended up doing HR, no relevance <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but it was very, very interesting. Um, I really didn't have that many options to network. Um, and it was very overwhelming. Um, first daughter, first one with a degree, trying to figure out things a little bit on my own. Um, and it was kind of trying to make an opportunity because my heart was in a place and then my mind and reality was in a different one. So there were so many internship opportunities, but most of them were unpaid. So I couldn't get them. It, it wasn't a a possibility at that stage so it made me have to work up sometimes a bit twice as hard I had to have my regular job I worked while I studied and then I tried networking as much as possible and uh, after like a few semesters and a few meltdowns and breakdowns I figured out I couldn't do it alone so I just really tried hard of networking and that's why I do believe that events like these are so important. You get a name, you get some sort of exposure. You know, we don't always have someone that helps us through a path, but I definitely do believe that people, once you know people, they really do have the best interest and want to help. Um, so I just tried as much as possible to get a mentor. We both had very limited time. So I had research pointed questions and I was able to get into international development um, and absolutely love it. So that was a little bit more on how my path chaotically yeah. came up. <laughs> just a quick follow-up, just because uh, when you were in college, were you thinking development as like the path you wanted to go through or did it kind of just sort of happen, you know, develop over time? Yeah, it, it kind of happened. I actually started in corporate and I did not like it. I was like, this is soulless. And I yeah. eventually knew that I, what I wanted to do is that my job had an impact. I know that my job can be pretty transactional to a point, but I wanted to recruit people that were passionate about what they were doing. And although I am not in the field doing the work, I get to recruit people that are passionate to change people's lives. So that for me is kind of a good balance. I made my heart happy. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, that's really great to hear. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, and Craig, we'll we'll end with you on this, okay. this uh, um, trip back to time. Thanks everyone for your stories and Jasmine also. Um, so I've graduated three times, undergrad, master's, PhD, and as an undergrad, I did a radical hippie major. We spent a lot of take, time taking over buildings, so I just knew I wanted to help deconstruct unjust systems, but I had no idea what that meant. I was interested in international affairs. The number one thing that helped me was studying abroad and a great mentor who pushed me to apply for Fulbright, and I thought that was only for important people, and she was very diligent and basically made me apply. 
And so fellowships and volunteering are one of the best ways to build a career. And so I was fortunate to have Fulbright for two years in Hungary. I was supposed to be doing research, but we started an NGO. So one of the things most people don't think about in their career path is fellowships. And you have to start exploring a year early. But there are so many funding opportunities where you don't have to do unpaid labor. A master's, I was living in Czech Republic, applied for a job, got a job. But you went to Peace, in DC, a great place to work. And then eventually went to IREX, another great place. PhD, I, some friends and I started our own NGO. And we, as we all finished our degrees, we were converting to full time. So I had this huge vision. We were going to change the world. Totally burnt out after 10 months, full-time work for half-time pay. So got really depressed, switched to a job in London, which I thought was my dream job. And I hated it. I didn't hate it. I didn't like it. Got depressed and quit. Thought it was a total failure. So so like, you know, like I don't think any of us have had like this simple career path. Um, so I, I didn't have a vision of what I wanted to do. Just work on unjust structures. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. I think, again, it sort of hits at the point of, I think it's it's important to remind people of, like I said before, the, that there, there's really no, very few straight paths in this in this sector. Um, so thank you all for sharing that. And uh, we're getting like a ton of great questions already, and and some of them are related to actually the ones I wanted to ask anyway. So uh, I may try to work a few of the questions in that are related to you know some of the topics we want to talk about. Um, and you already mentioned sort of uh, the fellowship and which kind of leads into like talking about experience um, in terms of the internships and volunteer experience that is quite highly valued. Um, I mean, the one question I, I wanted to ask broadly, and we'll, we'll, since we have you, Craig, we'll stick with you on this one. Um, you know, just traditionally volunteering and, and the internships are, have been crucial for you know, specifically in the development sector. Um, is that still the case, do you think? And um, related to that, there's a question about, um, you know, someone asking about experience, uh, you know, the, the, maybe not necessarily being able to afford to volunteer an interim because while there are more paid internships out there, uh, it, it, it's, still, it's still common for unpaid internships to be there. Volunteering obviously is traditionally not paid. So how it's becoming really hard to even afford uh, um, uh, a path in, in the sector for some people. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw out that, uh, just your thoughts on volunteering and, and internships. So the first thing I would say, there's lots of structural inequality around volunteering that, you know, so much of the volunteering is people from the global north. I mean, everyone can volunteer in their community, you know, their garden, you know, whether it's in their building, like my wife's on the condo board, you know, we're on different advisory boards, but so we can all, everyone, if they have a little bit of extra time can volunteer, but the, this kind of volunteerism where people mostly from the global north go to save people in the global south, there's a lot of ethical challenges with that. Um, you know, where, especially short-term volunteerism. So many, even at Georgetown, where I was for 10 years and still teaches, we had a fellowship program where we'd, you know, support our students, master students to go around the world to do interesting work with NGOs. And, it, and we, we even sent people like from Lebanon to Indonesia. So it wasn't always like global north to global south, but there was the question per person cost, was it worth it? It was good for the students. Was it worth it for the host organization? So there's so much going on there. Um, but I do think in general, it's not just volunteering, like whatever you're engaged with, whether if you're still on campus, can you get involved with student groups, volunteer in the community, learn how to run a budget, um, be on an advisory board, be, you know, so it's not just about going out there and volunteering somewhere else. It's about, you know, there's so many service learning opportunities at some universities. Um, you know, can you get involved in conferences, professional associations? And what employers really want is not just that you had an experience, they want skills. And it's a lot of those skills around how does the aid bureaucracy work? And obviously, undergrads have different levels of skills than grad students. But do you understand who allocates money, why that money is allocated, how to manage that money, how to design a project, how to evaluate a project, how to facilitate a project, how to be humble, you know, how to speak the language? So volunteering is a great way. You know, especially if it, if you think about the ethics of it in power dynamics, um, not just going overseas for a week and volunteering in an orphanage or you know building a school. Well, I'm not saying it's bad, um, but also as I said, fellowships are so amazing. So I was fortunate to have th three or four years of my life on full fellowship. Um, so and often as a fellowship, I would be doing professional things on the side. So having two years of Fulbright, I started an NGO. I got to go to conferences. So it's like. And if you can find a fellowship, whether it's from your university or some professional association or corporation, 
that often can be as valuable as volunteering or the Peace Corps, UNV. You generally have to be over 25, but you can volunteer online. Like also because of like micro volunteering now, there's so many opportunities like crisis mapping. So it's not always about going out there and doing something. Um, it's, you know, and it's often finding, leveraging your networks or you know, if you're interested in business for social impact, join that impact. Like find a lot of people don't look at the professional networks in their cities or their countries. So find whether it's teach for all. I mean, there's so many organizations now you don't have to go out and recreate the wheel. Um, or it could be as simple as, you know, if you like dancing, go go volunteer and teach kids to dance. Or if you like business, help, help micro entrepreneurs. So I'll pass. Yeah, no, that's really great. That's really, really insightful. Um, and Jasmine, I want to see if you had any uh, thoughts uh, in this area of, you know, the state of internships and volunteering and, and any, any advice you may have for, for pursuing this. Yeah, um, I also just wanted to share what I heard also in Craig's answer that I think is quite relevant and an important point, which is that it's not necessarily what you do, but it's always what you take out of what you do. And I think over the last like six, seven years, I've had so many different kinds of jobs. So a lot of them are just not anywhere publicly, but some of the ones that I have had that have been the most instrumental, and I will be updating my LinkedIn soon on this, but it's like, you know, being a sales associate, you learn so much about like community building, listening, attention to detail, stuff like this, you know? Um, and I think a lot of the time we put so much pressure on like that one thing or that impact or development looks like one particular uh, profession, like look like one particular job, or just because your title says something doesn't mean that and it's impactful doesn't mean that it's going to be, you know, so it's often really what you take out of it. So in reflecting on this question, the most important thing that I wanted to say was it's going to be an unconventional kind of answer to, to the question, which is that my biggest advice on this would be uh, that it's not about the experience and number of skills, but it's the mindset, which is a small thing in this question, but really wanted to emphasize that because mindset is just really everything. And the best possible mindset you could be now when you're like just graduating, or I heard some of you um, have already graduated, um, and maybe just I would write this down. Uh, if you have a pen and paper, uh, I wish someone had like written the tattooed this on my arm, um, which is to choose curiosity over confidence. So I'm going to repeat that again, which is to choose curiosity over confidence. Now, what I mean by this is that for over five years, I was confident I would go to law school and I worked hard to get into a top law school. Um, but when I looked away from this kind of linear path of confidence and security, I saw a new one that sparked my curiosity and it was one of startups, technology and new media, a path where I actually could still pursue my passion for human rights and women's rights um, and still apply my sort of uh, background in peace and conflict studies and gender based violence, but from a more innovative place. Um, and I followed that path and it ultimately led me to create The Bloom, an organization I love um, and I get to do what I love, but in a way that I love to do it. And it's not necessarily the look of social impact that I would have said, you know, six or seven years ago, but it's one that to me feels extremely impactful. Um, and there's this common phrase, I think that maybe a lot of you have heard because it's become very popular also on social media, which is that re rejection is just re redirection. And I really agree with that. And I think it's very much related to choosing curiosity over confidence, you know, just be bold, try new things. Um, it's a sign that you're putting yourself in new places and actively advocating for yourself. Obviously this gets tiring. Um, and it gets extremely tiring to follow your curiosity, but if you focus on the mindset, then you'll have that mentality that can take you much, much further. You know, you won't burn out necessarily. So how can you actually do that? What does it actually look like to start choosing curiosity over confidence? Um, one small way um, that each of you, I was like, if I'm the attendees today and I'm like hearing this random woman, Jasmine, say, choose curiosity over confidence. Um, here's what you can do. Um, what I would say is start diversifying the people that you reach out to. My mis biggest mistake was that I was networking and like sending messages to very similar looking people. Um, so one of the things that I think is a huge, huge power is even if you're working in the development sector, uh, reach out to someone in a completely different field, even if it's not directly related, just be curious, you know? Um, and those lessons can be applied eventually, I'm sure, to whatever path it is that you choose. But so I would say that 
uh, that would be my biggest advice uh, for this question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. I think, yeah, if you took a, take one thing away from today, that would be a great thing. And I see Craig nodding a lot. So um, that, yeah, that's great. That's a, and, and the way you explained it also <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, and also thank you to the panelists. Uh, I see you're all, uh, many of you are responding directly in the chat to some of these questions. Um, so I really appreciate you doing that. And, and um, so keep an eye on the chat uh, audience uh, for, for some also some great um, extra follow-ups to some of your questions there. Um, so yeah, I just want to get Nicole and, and Jennifer in just on the uh, topic of experience um, and, you know, with interning and volunteering. And because Nicole is the recruiter, the, I thought, you know, same question to Nicole, but also keeping like uh, a C, you know, people's CVs in mind, um, um, you know, for, for what you look for and maybe um, this postgraduate uh, uh, CV uh, from your perspective, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you now. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I, it is pretty interesting. Um, as a recruiter, you are basically trained to find gems in a resume that are not necessarily clear. Um, and so that expertise, that candidate, that profile to a higher manager that is not necessarily always convinced. So for me, I would say, um, and although this might be pretty conducive to doing more labor, but writing a CV conveyed towards what have been your contributions. It could be previous experiences. It could be projects. It could be even courses if you haven't had work experience, but how have your contributions helped shape how you see your professional work? How has it shaped your, um, your skills? I know it, it was mentioned before, but really kind of writing that resume towards the job that you want rather than in the past of what only you've done. So yes, you've done X, but that will help me to do Y kind of thing. Uh, in international development, I will say, please always include every language that you speak. That is so helpful. I've had students that I speak to and they're like, no, well, this is a dialect. And I'm like, you don't understand. We just literally re were recruiting for someone that needed that expertise. And sometimes it is through language that you're able to break in through a job. Maybe it is translation, um, doing a quick consultancy with a company or in a, a de development firm. So it could open up so many different ways. And yeah, just trying to shape that resume towards what you want, what your contributions have been, and highlight those skills. Um, there's always ways to kind of worth smith how your contributions are. But you can, if you do your research and the company that you're researching, you'll see kind of what the theme is. And normally the recruiter will have a similar mindset along with the hiring manager. So if you align your skills to the company's values, you will have a pretty good shining CV. Yeah, that's how it's a really important point about the, the we might get into that a bit more. Um, we I want to touch on networking a little bit um, later, but uh, part of part of networking is to connect with people at the companies that you're interested in and and that's part of the whole research process. And, so it's uh, so that I think that's really smart to, to make that point to uh, to to, to uh, tailor that CV in that way. Um, thank you, uh, and and Jennifer, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this uh, topic of experience, um, whether it's from whether you want to put your career coaching hat on or from your own personal experience. Um, what are some things that you might want to add um, in this area? Thank you. Um... So I lately have been thinking more and more about how job searches and our career materials uh, parallel with hosting people at your home, like for dinner parties or for events, you know, big or small, right? And you think about what well, for me, when it comes to career materials, um, I love what Nicole is sharing of like, you need to direct, you need to Put in the resume, people don't know what uh, experience you have unless you have put it in there in your CV. So you think about like when someone comes to your home and they ask, they, they, when they have to ask you, where's the bathroom? I need to use the bathroom. 
you as the host, you know, when someone comes into your home, it's so nice when you say, here's the restroom, here's where you can sit, here's where you can put your purse or your jacket. And you think about rather than making people search for these things, like in a resume, let me, how do I search in a messy or, you know, unorganized, um, you know, different formats, different fonts, different colors. How do you make it aesthetically pleasing so that immediately someone knows where to go to understand your education, your experience and how it relates to a role, the languages you speak, um, the countries that you've worked in? Uh, and when you can signpost that for people on whether it's on your LinkedIn profile or your your CV or portfolio, it's so helpful. And I will say too, just you know, thinking about um, I in my first job at World Resources Institute after the Peace Corps, you know, in my job search, I just put in the like I just put the word French in and job boards because I spoke French and I was like, I don't know what other skills <laughs> I don't know what other skills I have. Um, and that's how I found the role. And then part of my job was reviewing resumes um, of candidates. And it's like, yes, we had certain things we're looking for and people really made you hustle and work for it. And at some point, it's not worth your time when you have other people who are really highlighting directly, here's how my past skills align with what you're looking for with this opportunity. So um, if you, it's like, again, with home design and interior design, you might think your house looks great. And then someone comes in and they either confirm that, or you think like, what do you think? And you're like, oh, maybe you should move this couch or chair. Um, it's always great to get another set of eyes or AI eyes. On your, you know, there's a great website, jobscan.co. There's so many great templates out there. Um, we shouldn't, yeah. So please reach out to somebody to get an, a second opinion. If you're wondering, uh, if your CV like looks right. Can I just add on something too, to what Jennifer said? Yeah. Yeah. yeah please. Do. And it ties into also what Nicole, you said, I, I feel like it's so interesting. Um, both of you, like when you're talking about bringing things out, I, I struggled a lot with that in my early career because uh, I didn't know how to talk about myself, which I think a lot of us like typically in our early careers like struggled with, um, but also because I couldn't see, I wasn't a good, uh, necessarily a good register of my own skills. And unfortunately, I think this does tend to happen quite a lot. So I would say kind of bridging what you both have said about bringing things out, um, you, you mentioned, uh, Jennifer, to not do it, like get someone. I think if each of you listening today could set up some kind of buddy system with, uh, you could just reach out to someone random here on this chat. I don't know if you've ever done that in a Zoom room, but it could be quite fun. Um, I've done this a lot, like on LinkedIn. Um, I facilitate sort of like uh, storytelling circles where basically just ask one person who doesn't really know you, and you can do this in the chat, like today, I would highly recommend it also as a networking tip. Um, and just ask them what story uh, your current online presence says about you. And I think we often focus and put so much pressure on like a CV. But actually, it depends on which kind of employer you're applying to. But the reality is that our digital footprint is just as important as a physical CV. And a lot of the companies that I speak to only care about LinkedIn. They don't look at your CV. They don't really look at your cover letter. This is obviously uh, doesn't apply everywhere, not. Um, but you have that online presence as a superpower. But oftentimes, we don't know what the story of our online profile said. So that's where some kind of buddy system comes in. Ask a, a single friend or a stranger hey, you know, do you want to like just do this with exercise with me for like 40 minutes and ask them what story does my CV tell you? Like, what do you know? What do you see about me? What's interesting? I think oftentimes when we think about jobs and job searching, we, we tend to go in solo mode. I think the key thing here is to go in community mode. Like, don't make this a solo process. There's no reason to. A lot of us are looking for jobs and I think there's this underlying competitive thing, you know, but actually everyone benefits and you benefit ultimately in helping someone else and you can build that relationship of reciprocity. So that's just one thing I wanted to add to all of this is that it doesn't have to be a solo process. Yeah. Very good. Absolutely. And it's, um, uh, I'd like to give anyone a chance to add anything else on this topic, but also it was a good, it's kind of a good time to segue into networking a bit and LinkedIn and, and, and what you just mentioned and, but, um, so uh, I wanted to ask 
uh, we also had a question about sort of styling yourself, which I think is related to um, how you structure your, your LinkedIn profile, things like that. So I would like to shift there, but and, and I'll start with Craig in that area, but also Craig, if there's, if there's anything from the um, previous uh, uh, topic or, or responses, you can jump in and add to that, or um, otherwise, um, I'd love, love to get your thoughts uh, about, um, you know, kind of how to use, uh, optimize your kind of LinkedIn use, whether it's your profile or, net or sort of networking uh, strategies for making connections. Um, so that, thanks so much. Um, to echo what Jasmine says, um, there's also a big difference by geographic region and sometimes by identity, not to say it's all true, but in general, I found people from outside of the US or outside of North America, it's not true for everyone, tend to undersell themselves and particularly women, not all women. And so often it's uh, it's often talking to someone, you know, and if you have a career counselor at university or a peer or PCDN or the Bloom, like having someone decipher what your experience is and help you re-articulate that into a coherent story of metrics and data. And so for example, like we had a client and she's like, I haven't done, she was applying for promotion. She's like, I haven't done anything. And her resume was aesthetically beautiful, but had no content in terms of metrics. And we're like, okay, what did you do on a daily basis? She's like, I managed a team of 50 people, a budget of like a million dollars. Like it wasn't on her resume. And so it's like finding ways to draw that out and put in a coherent story. Um, for LinkedIn, the number one thing, if you have not read Adam Grant's work, The Social Psychologist Give and Take, it's a really fun book. Um, if you approach LinkedIn or social media as a transactional way or as a taker, you're just going to get frustrated. You, you can use it to find jobs, but the number one way to use LinkedIn is um, engagement, impact, empathy, and I would use Jasmine's word, curiosity. And it is, if you use it that way without expecting results and just say, I'm going to connect with interesting people all over the world and not ask them for anything. And just because it'll enrich your feed. And if you contribute content and jobs, even things you might be applying for and become almost like this network hub. And it's not about being strategic. It's just about your curiosity and what, if you see an article or a job and it makes you think for a second, then you might share it on LinkedIn and provide a comment why. And unlike Twitter, which I still use, although Musk is destroying it, and Instagram and all those other platforms, the LinkedIn algorithm thrives on positive engagement. Um, and so really using the power of the algorithm to connect with others and also the algorithm rec recommend people, groups, and all that. So if you spend 20 minutes a day on LinkedIn, not job searching, but network building, and don't, you know, if I contacted with just if I connected with Justin and immediately said, Justin, can we have coffee? Like that's not the way to use LinkedIn. It's like you do some authentic engagement. And then if you see some mutual overlap after a month or two months, you might be like, hey Justin, you're you're doing really interesting stuff. Might you be open to a chat? But you're not asking them for a job. Because a lot of people will connect and say, Jasmine, can you help me get a job? It's about it's about kind of connecting around shared interest. And again, um, the head of recruitment at Ashoka, Bob Spore, a great person to follow on LinkedIn. He reached out to me years ago, and I just, this is a great example. And he came from LinkedIn for good, and he said, you're interesting, Ashoka's interesting, who do you want to connect with? And I already had friends at Ashoka. So he set up this informal peer buddy networking system. So I said, here's three people I don't know. He got double opt-in, and so I've had like this buddy, she's no longer at Ashoka, but like we just have, we're in totally different sectors of impact, but we like chat periodically, we share ideas, we soundboard. So it's like connecting with people outside of your interest geographically. I mean, I, I don't know anything about engineering, but I've been talking to peace engineers. Like the, I don't know anything about urban design, but I love, so it's like, it's also, even if I'm never going to work in it, just expand your horizons. Yeah. I think that's, that's really good advice. Um, Cause yeah, I think, uh, People, yeah, uh, you know, it's fine to ask someone for coffee, but it's, it's not really the best. You have to really dedicate the, it's really sort of like becomes part of your, um, you know, your daily work almost. You have to sort of, <laughs> that time, um, you know, obviously it's uh, better if you enjoy doing this type of reach out, but yeah, to, to make the most use of your time um, and get the most out of it. I think you gave a lot of great examples of how to do that. Um, I want to get everyone to weigh in more on, on sort of LinkedIn and networking and if, if you, but I, I'd like to shift just Nicole um, on this topic because uh, as a recruiter, obviously, I think I've gotten questions before of like, if I want this job and I can find the recruiter on LinkedIn, do I, do I just reach out and <laughs> ask for an interview? Or um, so, how do you sort of 
what are your thoughts on that from the sort of like the recruiter side uh, of how you know you might recommend people um, show their interest or um, or are there any sort of other things that you see that are sort of could be red flags for like organizations where like uh, well you know I'd just like to get your thoughts from your perspective uh, as a sure. recruiter. Um, I will speak for myself and then I will give a, an opinion of what I feel that sometimes different um, recruiters fall into. So I do not mind messages at all. Um, it's just hard to keep up <laughs> with the messages because the influx is a lot. And if you are here and I haven't responded to a message or a LinkedIn message, please know it's not on you. It is a reflection on me. Um, and we're always interested and willing to help, but unfortunately don't always have the time for informational interview. However, before this event, I did rile up a few colleagues that are available for <laughs> informational interviews. So we have a cadre for hopefully um, those requests if they do come in. Um, and I would say, I think it, it also depends on the type of recruiter. Um, they're very transactional recruiters that are just about filling the role. And then there are other transactional, that there are other recruiters that are about fit and trying to find a person. And that reach out is so important for the recruiter that's trying to find the right fit. For a transactional one, they'll see, okay, there's interest, they might be able to move fast. And it's nothing wrong with either type of recruiter. It might just be tied to the need of the company at that point or the firm. Um, but my motto in life is ask. The last thing they can say is either no or not respond. And you can keep doing it. Um, and you can try to see if you can connect also with the recruiter. Recruiters always know the recruiters. And they like people's posts and you might learn of a different company or a different firm that you didn't hear. Um, and the algorithms for LinkedIn are pretty interesting on how you end up on someone else's page. Um, and as a hardcore introvert, I will say um, networking didn't come easy to me, but in also a very virtual setting that people are, might be a little standoffish because they're always like, here, I'm going to help you, but then I'll charge you for something. Like they always feel like there has to be an exchange of thing. I think what Craig um, and Jasmine, I'm sure Jennifer has done too, is like to share that expertise and that knowledge for free. Because when they see that you are literally just sharing what you know, it can become relatable. So at, like for you as well, what has been your experience during college, last semester, that might help you be able to make connections um, that haven't happened before. Um, and in terms of my actual job for recruitment, um, although I switched a bit more to the HRBP side, but I've done recruitment for the last 15 years. And between the searches for LinkedIn and DevX, that's how I've been able to keep this job because I've been able to find people. So I would say like, if you are very interested in a in a specific sector, make sure you use words particular to that sector on your profile. It will make your search function like capability come up. Like your that might not be the right word, but it it might um, increase your chances. Sorry, of being found by a recruiter. Um, if you like a company more and you look at a specific, their website and they're using specific words, use them as well. Like there are different ways to tailor your LinkedIn profile and see your LinkedIn profile um, as a living document. Update it. it, it sometimes we only update it when we're looking for opportunities. But if you did something amazing, put it in there. I'm not a good example of this. But I think that people should be doing it. Um, I saw Jennifer's profile, Jasmine's profile, and Craig, and they're amazing. And I think, you know, they actually encouraged me to be like, okay, Nicole, you have to kind of get your things together. You can't let this fall through because I've met so many amazing professionals and professionals to be just through LinkedIn. And, you know, we end up seeing each other at a team retreat or something. So I'm not sure if I fully answered your question. Let me know if I need to. Oh, you, oh my God, you, you gave so much great insight. Yeah, I purposely keep these questions kind of broad because uh, <laughs> letting you all fill in, fill in the gaps, but your great insight. So that, that, was, that was really helpful. And thank you for the shout out to introverts. Uh, I, I appreciate that oh, one really? personally. 
Um, uh, I'm fangirling but, Nicole so hard right now. That was such a like, well, actually I was taking notes too. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're all learning sorry. here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I want to get ja Jasmine, if you want to add anything on sort of LinkedIn and then I want, I'll get Jennifer to also join in and then, oh uh, yeah, we'll see how much time we have left for other questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm, I saw a question in the chat from Christopher that's very relatable. Christopher, I have such bad social media anxiety. And I actually gave a workshop in the Bloom um, two weeks ago to our community about how I went from anxiety to joy. But like one of the big takeaways was that <laughs> the anxiety really never goes away. I think it actually kind of just gets worse. But the tools to actually address that anxiety, if you have the right tool, then you can always curb it, um, but also just live with it in a way where it doesn't consume you. I think social media is literally set up for us to fail in some ways, but it gives us idea and impression, right, that we like need it and that um, it's amazing and we get rewarded, but it's also so can be super toxic, of course. Like comparison is super natural um, on LinkedIn. That's probably my biggest, like, I think, uh, rabbit hole on LinkedIn. I was actually away from LinkedIn for like two months because of this. And I'm uh, really happy to talk about it in my community um, vulnerably, but I've also benefited so much from LinkedIn. So I do advocate for getting good at in your own way, like try to understand, I would say, just be curious, not it's like the same lesson that I gave you, Christopher, I hope you're listening. Um, same lesson here, just choose curiosity over confidence. You don't have to be a master at LinkedIn right now. Just be curious. And for anyone here that is an introvert, Nicole, I can also relate because I used to be an introvert and now I'm a forced extrovert. <laughs> um, but what I would say is if you are facing social media anxiety, if you're like, what is LinkedIn? I don't want to be posting. There are these people that post like 15 times a day. I am not one of these people. I don't particularly like following these kinds of people because their content comes up all in my feed. So if you're facing anxiety and you are not sure where to start or you took a break and want to come back, here's what I would do. Also, Nicole, maybe this is also for you. What I have is my joy list. So I have 10 people in my notes app that I have that I follow on LinkedIn. And I'm very clear about who I love to follow. And I just pay attention to them. And I don't have to do anything, but just be really, really, really intentional about what you consume. I think when it gets becomes a problem is when you start endlessly scrolling um, and you don't like protect your flame. That's when things go awry. Um, so yeah, thanks, Nabila. I just see yeah, also a forced extrovert. Um, what I would do is have a list of like, maybe you, if you're in the development space, pick like 10 development professionals. This is actually a good idea. I might put it in the bloom for some of you all here of some of my favorite people to follow in the social impact space. I've done some of these roundups before in the past, but I'll do one again in the newsletter. But um, just being clear about who you like, because I think when you start consuming content that actually brings you joy and you find useful, then you also can get empowered to start maybe posting yourself or just inspiration for your own profile. Um, I do think that, I mean, for me, like LinkedIn has empowered my entire career and it's because I used to be an introvert. And now thanks to LinkedIn, I just started breaking more and more out of my shell and building a community, building a network. I didn't have a network. I didn't have a community before I started you know, really getting active online. Um, and a lot of my friends, I will say this, and maybe this isn't super obvious. I've made so many meaningful in-person friendships through LinkedIn, a lot of people, um, and also a lot of speaking opportunities. Also for everyone here, I'm here because Justin reached out to me on LinkedIn. <laughs> and I think that if I hadn't, you know, placed a lot of love and care into my profile and stuff like that, it's a really nice way for people to get to know you. Other social media for professional connections are not as obvious, you know, and it, at least for the development space, I don't think Instagram and TikTok are as obvious. <laughs> but I would say um, getting clear about who you're following. Um, and then before you start doing outreach, because I think Craig had mentioned this, but, you know, and also Nicole, like the idea of people reaching out to you, be really thoughtful in the way that you reach out to someone. Don't just send a connection request. I get like, I have now sitting in my uh, LinkedIn 800 connection requests, and I cannot go through all of them, but I will only usually accept the ones that are, I'll try to, but the first ones that pop out are when you have a, a clear message. So I would say put in some time, you can have a co copy and paste template, um, but I would also say start reaching out to people one person per week 
on LinkedIn, new person, um, and or one new connection. And um, yeah, and that goes back to the community building and the other career related questions. It's fundamental to have a network and LinkedIn is a great place for that. So yeah. Yeah, talking. absolutely. <laughs> That's really, yeah. Uh, yeah, as as an as an introvert who is is forced to moderate events, uh, <laughs> which should help me come much a, a little bit. I'm grateful for that. But I'm grateful for LinkedIn so, too, because um, because <laughs> um, yeah, like if you want to see something funny, it's like watching me try to network in person at like a in person event. It's like it's the most awkward thing in the world. So um, I, I just, I, just just want to add yeah, two. Just want to add two. That we we should be getting Microsoft should be sponsoring this since they own LinkedIn. Um, but just yeah. say also link, LinkedIn groups. The functionality is horrible, but there's lots of groups you can join. And if I, you can, someone said, can you message people if you don't have premium LinkedIn? If you're part of the same group, you can message whether it's a second or third degree connection. And if like, if I didn't know Nicole and she requests to join me and I see we're part of two or three of the same groups automatically and be like, she, like, I'm going to say yes. And then Slack can be very useful. There's lots of Slack channels and there are some Facebook groups. I'm trying to stay off of that, but there's lots of Slack groups you can join that are sub communities and, and um, Discord. That's really helpful. Um, we're getting short on time, but I want to get Jennifer in on this too, because uh, unfortunately, I didn't mean to make you go laugh. Because uh, they've, they've, I hope um, there's been so many great points today. So uh, no pressure to, you know, uh, keep the bar up there, Jennifer. But actually, a lot of the stuff that's been talked about, we we've had conversations about networking in previous events, and a lot of this sounded like um, familiar advice. But I want to give you a chance to jump in here too. Um, if yeah, I'll share to quickly an experience that I've had lately that I was surprised by. I, I see LinkedIn as an experiment. Um, and so I like to look at, now you have some analytics that you can see what posts do well. Of course, you see the likes and the comments. And um, if somebody, I, and I admire and envy at times, but now I get to do it for my job, but people who are in a position, if you're graduating soon and you're maybe not currently employed or you're employed, but you know, maybe in a job at college where it's okay to be public about your job search. Um, tag companies and people who are relevant to your industry or what you're interested in. So if you are interested, I saw someone put that they're, you know, pursuing climate engineering careers. Um, like others have said here on the panel, share what your process is with others and it will become a virtuous cycle. So maybe you go on to Terra.do or Terra do, I don't know how they said, and you find 10 cool companies that they've invested in or that they're part of and say, share that on LinkedIn and it'll attract eyes onto your profile and it'll further cement your expertise or your interests and draw people to you who share that interest. Um, and what I like to say, it's like, you don't need a hundred jobs. Um, you don't need a hundred connections. Sometimes all it takes is like one or two people who you connect with, who really have like that same niche interest um, to kind of catapult your career. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's, that's really important to mention too. Um, great. Thank you. So uh, I wish we had another hour because uh this is like been such a great conversation, um, but I'm going to squeeze in one more question. I know my producers might get mad at me, but um, I want to circle back to the first question I asked about your your younger selves in college. Um, if you could try to keep your answers short, 30 seconds, maybe just, and I know Jasmine already gave a sort of a piece of advice um, that might fit this category, but one piece of advice that you would give your, your younger self um, where you are now looking back to uh, where you were, you know, getting ready to graduate. And I'll, we'll start with, actually start with Jennifer because we have her here. Hmm. Where I was now when I graduated. I mean, it's fascinating. I loved when Craig said, you know, yeah, so I had my bachelor's, I did my master's, and then I finished my doctoral program in August of 2021. And at each of those are very natural, you know, junctures where you look at your life and career and, and pivoting. And when I finished my doctoral degree, I thought, oh, this is going to, open up the world of opportunities. And actually I ended up, I quit my job the week after I graduated because my husband had an opportunity that moved our family to Malawi. So I was unemployed and I had no prospects. <laughs> um, and it was that, and I, I, you know, narrator, I did get jobs after um, multiple, this portfolio career life, but 
you know, looking at my younger self, I, I wrote down what Jasmine said, and I was um, loved being on uh, Craig's podcast once because curiosity has truly been the cornerstone of my success. And that means going to webinars where I don't understand what the title of it is um, on cybersecurity, crypto, blockchain. So, and it's like, I don't even know what this is, but there's something that's interesting. I go, I meet, I connect with one person from the event in the participant list. And then from there, like, it's just been, uh, you know, I don't know what great, like dominoes in a good way. Um, so stay curious. And um, I, of course, what Craig is saying, being a giver and a taker, that has really not um, being so strategic in the networking of, yeah, what can I suck out of you? And, but more, how can I fill other people's cup while you're filling your own? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think too, I see this all the time and just have to say it, especially with young graduates, but actually anyone in their career Please keep a list of people who support you along the way, whether that's giving you, sending you job opportunities or who do a reference letter. Um, it's painful, but you see it happen all the time. People announce, I got this new job. And then, um, you know, maybe you didn't let your professor know who was a reference for you personally, and then they find out along with everyone else. So please, um, those relationships are going to be the foundation yeah. of a successful career. So think about that. And it just takes, a few minutes, but it's really important. Yeah, that's, that's to thank them. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Be grateful and be helpful. I think you're good things. Uh, Jasmine, do you have a? Do you want to stick with your earlier one, or do you have another little? Work I have another. For... Oh, I have another. <laughs> <laughs> but Jennifer, that was such good advice. Actually, oh my God, I wish I had started tracking like every single person because no individual success story is an individual success story. It's a collective success story. And success is an a collective act and it takes a lot of people to get you where you are. And it's this illusion that you think that you see this person and you never get to see the people. Sometimes it's, it's okay. You don't always have to see every single person who has shaped the people that you see in this, this, this panel today. But the reality is that there's hundreds of people like that helped me to get to where I am. And I wish that you could all see them. Um, and I wish I had tracked them. Um, I totally agree with Jennifer. You should have like a spreadsheet or a list of start documenting every single person. You don't have to like keep in touch with them, but just to have as a nice journal. My advice would be that community is everything. Um, start getting really good at listening. That is the most important quality that you could possibly have in any career is being a very good listener. Um, and especially because sometimes you'll remember something that someone said and they'll be so surprised. And that is a beautiful thing to put in a cover letter, to put in a, just to listen and get really good at that. Um, and then that will also help you build community because if you listen, um, then you know how to help the people around you. And so that is the addendum to this, to this, uh, advice, which is to just get very good at lifting the people around you up. Um, we rise by lifting others is sometimes this like phrase that people put on a PowerPoint cheesy, but it's true. Um, and it's really nice if you can, if you're struggling right now in your career, chances are that others around you are as well. And sometimes stepping outside of yourself and supporting someone else is not necessarily the most obvious way of helping yourself. But if you can and have the energy, do that because it could save you as well along the way. Um, so, yeah. So that's the core lesson is get good at lifting people's uh, other people up. And the way to do that is to just be a good listener. Yeah. That's excellent. Man, this is like so much great bonus tips here at the end. Thank you for that. Um, and Nicole, we'll go to you if there's anything you'd like to add. Uh, I think it would be just because your path looks different. It doesn't mean it's still not successful. If you can do a checklist, God knows I love them and do it, but I think honestly, being content has led me to see life, even as a professional in my personal life, rather than a checklist, more as a recipe. I keep adding things to it and it enhances different parts of it. Um, and I hope that some of what we've shared, I think it's been amazing information, but if it doesn't resonate with you, you still have your own path. It doesn't matter what a LinkedIn article says, you will be able to do it. But I do agree with Jasmine and Jennifer. It, it's about being grateful, 
but also being able to use a community. You don't have to do it alone. There's so many people, you, your experience, although it might feel very personal and unique, you're not the only person that has gone through it. And maybe finding a person that has a similar pathway or that can empathize with it. Um, yeah. And help you support to where you want to go. So. Yeah, that's really, it's really great to mention. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, Craig, I'll, I'll let you close this. Close um, so I think when I was younger, I had a little bit more of this assumption if I can get to the right position of influence, not that, not that I would save the world, but I could have a big impact and, you know, social change or impact is a team sport. And none of us have, we all have little bits of answers. So it's like, unless we're doing this collaboratively, even though there's egos and funding and we're, you know, there are some competition, like what's the point? And the world is in such crisis that it's like, just find the right next thing. Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, some people want to have career paths and like, but for me, it's like, what is the right next opportunity? But that's also skills building because whatever you're learning now in five things are changing so fast. Like the skills you have today, unless you're continually updating them, like are going to be not so relevant in five to 10 years. So it's like curiosity, team sport, um, helping others. And just like, I mean, I, I wish we could change the system that we'd spend what we spend on defense on like good things in the world. So it's like, it's not just about our little niche. It's like, we, we need systematic change. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but you know, at least my friend Flynn Coleman said something really powerful. You can find her online. She said something, hope is our resistance. Like we were talking about how do you just not burn out and like hide under, like watch Netflix 24 hours a day. It's like, like, I think all of us in this call feel like we need to do something, even if we're not, and so we're going to see this huge change. So it's like, be aware you're going to burn out, get frustrated and, and like, but if you do it in community with other people, it's, you know, it can help sustain you. All right. I, that's, that's, yeah. Very, very good. Sorry, I was responding to that. Thank you, Kanya, who thanks me for organizing and I thank you for joining. And on that note, I'm going to thank everybody for joining. Um, this is so, yeah, overflowing with such great info. Um, and we did go over, but I think it was worth it because we got, um, such a great end to that conversation. And we got so many questions that uh, I tried to work in as many into the topics we were talking to. And, and thankfully the panels panels were so great to um, um, to answer some questions directly and, and, and they've given you opportunities to get in touch with them as well separately. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, the panel. Um, and again, we'll, get, we'll send out the recording um, in your email and we'll publish the article so it'll be accessible to all um, early next week. And uh, on that note, uh, I'll thank you so much.